Welcome to Glenwood Baptist Church peaceful protest. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I sometimes say, welcome to church, the assembly of the accepted in Christ, Amen. the brotherhood of the beloved, the congregation of the converted, the family of the forgiven, the haven for the heaven bound, the organization of the organism, and the society of souls set free. Amen. Amen. We're glad you're here a part of it. Will you stand with me, please? And turn to Exodus chapter 17. We'll begin reading at verse 8. You following along silently while I read aloud, the Bible says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out, men, and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow... I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. It came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi, for he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Our text first will be verse number 12, where the Bible says, but Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Let's bow our heads and hearts together for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Thank you for the security, the salvation, the serenity that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I thank you for the wonderful salvation that you provided for any lost person who would trust your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins according to the Scriptures, was buried, and rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. I pray if there's anyone here who may be religious but has never trusted Christ as Savior, that today they would do it. Now, Father, I pray for your children. And I pray that this would not be, as already has been prayed, that this would not be just a time where we're hearers only, but I pray that this would be a time where we would hear the Word of God and respond properly with a desire and commitment to do the Word of God. I pray that the invitation will evidence our surrender uh, to your will for our lives. Save lost souls. Strengthen God's people. Cleanse us, dear Lord. Comfort those who need it. And we'll give you praise for what you do. For you alone can do the things that we're talking about and asking for. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Won't you be seated? Reading through the Old Testament, especially certain portions of it, is labor, it's work. The Bible says that uh, there is much labor and study. And if you read the Old Testament, you'll find places that are hard to read and get through. But we've got people in this church that since I've been here have been reading your Bible through. And what a blessing it has been to hear of that and to know that you're doing it. And if you're not doing it, 
yet I'd like to encourage you to start today. Amen. We have materials on the, the table in the foyer if you'd like to be able to kind of keep record. Uh, by the way, my wife finished her Bible reading this morning. Did you say 47? For the 47th time she's gone through the Bible from front to back. And um, uh, I'd like to encourage you to start. Whatever rate you do, if you'll have a rate and a record, it'll help you to be disciplined about it. If you don't have some discipline about it, and that's why most of us don't accomplish anything for the Lord. We don't have discipline. Uh, we call ourselves disciples, but we don't have much discipline, and that's what a disciple ought to have. But if you'll get disciplined about it, you will be able to read your Bible through all the way through from front to back. And it will help you. I personally would like to recommend that you make it a habit that you do till the day that you die or till God calls you home because it will help you. It will clean you. The Word of God is many things. And one of the things it's compared to is water. And it will wash you. It will help you. Listen, there's a lot of stuff in this world to get your mind going in the wrong direction. And you need your mind going the right direction. The Word of God will help you. Now, in reading through the Bible, I love uh, reading about the emancipation of Israel uh, from Egypt in the book of Exodus, don't you? Yeah. And I may not understand everything I read, but I enjoy it. And perhaps one of the most dramatic scenes in the Bible is when God parted the Red Sea yeah. and the Israelites escaped from their bondage in captivity. And what amazing display that is of the grace, the mercy, and the power of God. God showed Pharaoh a thing or two so that he changed his tune from, Who is the Lord? I know not the Lord, neither will I let the children of Israel go. He changed his tune. And you will too if you and God ever have a showdown. Amen. Amen. God is able to humble the mightiest of men. That's right. Amen. Without even breaking a sweat. Yeah. After the people of God escaped, God fed them supernaturally with bread from heaven called manna. Then He gave them drink miraculously from the rock in Horeb. But with this wonderful liberty that they had and the glorious provision that God gave, yet we find in the opening of this passage in verse 8, then came Amalek, an enemy. And I want you to know, my friend, that even though that once you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, your salvation is secure, Amen. even though there's no way that if you trust Christ as your Savior, that you're not going to heaven. Okay? It is guaranteed. That's right. Yeah. If you trust Christ as Savior, you have everlasting life Amen. as a present possession. Yeah. If it only lasted until you backslid or did something wrong, it would not be everlasting. That's right. yeah. It would just be temporary. But in spite of the fact that you're sealed by the Spirit of God under the day of redemption, but despite the fact that you are kept in the hands of God, despite the fact that you're predestinated to be conformed to the image of God's Son Amen. at the adoption to wit the redemption of our body, you will have opposition between here and heaven. That opposition will not keep you from going to heaven. But that opposition can keep you from enjoying victory in your life. There are many Christians who do not have the victory that God would have them to have. Amen. And I'm telling you, my friends, that one of the reasons why God has established New Testament local churches, and one of the reasons why the Bible says not forsaking the assembling of yourself together as the manner of some is, the reason for that is you need encouragement. Amen. You not only need to be fed, you need encouragement and exhortation from one another. You will tend to be like the people that you are closest to. That's why I recommend every Christian get 
and become a part of a Bible-believing New Testament fundamental independent Baptist church, a Bible-believing church like this one, as soon as possible. Amen. It was two weeks after I got saved, before I got baptized and became a member uh, of a church, but that was because I was a teenage boy, and Dad was unsaved, and he took us out of town the next weekend. But after that, we almost never missed a, a Sunday uh, going to a church. And uh, I didn't go to church hardly at all before I got saved. But when I got saved, I, I got real churchy. Now, Amalek was one of Israel's most persistent enemies. And what we're reading here in this chapter, the battle was actually being conducted on the ground by Moses' assistant, Joshua. Moses supervised the people from the top of the hill. And as you read here and some of you are acquainted with, that when Moses held up the rod of God, Israel prevailed. Israel won in the battle. But as his hands got tired and began to lower, Amalek would begin to get the upper hand and would beat Israel. Thank God for people who see the need. Amen. There were two men. Aaron and Hur, that saw and evaluated what was going on, and they gave Moses the support that he needed until the battle was won. Amen. We call this teamwork. Yeah. Joshua and the people were engaged in the fight. Moses was positioned on the hill. Aaron and Hur supported Moses uh, through the battle, and God gave the victory. Amen. Amen. I want to title this morning's message, The Independent Baptist Cooperative Program. Yeah. Amen. Some of you won't, don't have a clue about the title, but I've taken the title from the fact that the Southern Baptists, I was saved in the Southern Baptist Convention, have for years participated. Now, it's not going on since Acts chapter 2. I don't know how, much, how many of you realize that the Southern Baptist Convention is actually in light of church history, a rather recent invention just over the last couple of hundred years. But the Southern Baptists have for years participated in a unified financial endeavor called the cooperative program. It's the corrupt nature of that program that I have found so distasteful and over which I left the convention back in 1972, never to return. But we independent Baptists, uh, however independent we may be, you and I cannot get the job done alone. We need to cooperate. You need a local church. And we especially need, within our local church, to learn to cooperate and to help, to support, to encourage one another. My friend, my desire is is for our church to reach unsaved people with the gospel Amen. of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we'll do that by all working together to get many uh, hooks out in the water right. to be able to bring them in. Then when we assemble as a church, dearly beloved, I want you to be able to come to church and when you leave, feel like you're stronger for having come here. Amen. I want you, when you leave, be a little happier that you're saved. Amen. I want you when you leave to be a little bit more excited about being a child of God Amen. and knowing that you're going to heaven Amen. when you die and knowing that Jesus could come today Amen. looking for that blessed hope Amen. and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You think your preacher's a little cockeyed? It's because I got one eye toward the sky <laughs> and one eye out on the fields. And I won't be that way until Jesus calls me home. I thank the Lord for each of you who've worked in this church for, for years in proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to this area. Thank God for those who came out this Saturday morning to go out and proclaim the gospel. Folks, if you want to know where the action is, the action is not here on Sunday. The action's out there in the Word. And I encourage you to come this next Saturday morning at 10 o'clock and go out with us uh, to reach people for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I pray that God will use the message this morning
to encourage us, though, to realize uh, I, I'm very thankful for, for the fact that in the midst of all of the fear that we've got uh, in Jacksonville and across the country, I'm thankful for this good crowd we've got here this morning. Amen. Isn't that a blessing to see? Amen. Just uh, snuck away and, hud and hidden away in a, in a little uh, backyard area of the residential part that used to be known as the Glenwood Community. Yeah. It's a Bible-believing church on fire for God. Amen. Amen. Glenwood Baptist Church. And the Lord's enabled that by His Holy Spirit working through people who are willing to cooperate and do what you can. I want to encourage you to find your part in God's Independent Baptist Cooperative Program. I want to point out a few things to you about Moses because one of the great sayings that one of the well-known independent Baptist preachers of the past was known for, and I'm sure that he wasn't the one who coined it, but he became known for saying that everything rises and falls on leadership. And it's important for leadership to be right. I don't find in the Bible things laid out saying that if a person wants to be a member of a church, he better be sure that he does all these things. But it does have a list of things about bishops and deacons. That's because of the importance of leadership. And I want to say, number one, that Moses was positionally essential. Moses was positionally essential. God has ordained order in any kind of institution that he has. God's ordained a chain of command and order in every institution. Doesn't matter whether it's the home, government, or the church. And Moses in the Old Testament, and even that was called a church, even though it wasn't a New Testament church. Moses was essential positionally. He wasn't essential in the sense that God couldn't do uh, without him, but he, was, he needed that man in that position. There came a time when God moved Moses out of that position. And he moved somebody else in. Yep. I'm not fool enough to think that uh, God's uh, blessings upon Glenwood Baptist Church are totally resting upon me and my responsibility. Right. God is able to move somebody else in Amen. just as sure as he's able to move somebody out. You folks know that Moses were, was replaced by Joshua. Yeah. Joshua got to do something that Moses did not do. Yeah. Joshua got to bring the people in to the promised land. <laughs> but it is important to recognize God's order. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 17, Obey them that have the rule over you, yeah. and submit yourselves. Why? For they watch for your souls, as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. Right. For that is unprofitable for you. That's right. The Bible, that's Hebrews 13, verse 17. By the way, the Bible doesn't tell a preacher how to get people to follow him. Right. It just tells people to follow your preacher. Just like the Bible don't tell you husbands how to make your wife obey you. If it did, I mean tell you, I have that underlined. <laughs> I ain't figured it out yet. But the Bible doesn't tell me that I have to make Mrs. O'Neill a little better. I just spank her occasionally because I like her. <laughs> Don't be fooled, folks. Probably if anybody gets spanked, I get spanked. <laughs> But the Bible tells the wife to submit herself unto her own husband. The Bible doesn't tell a preacher how to get leadership. There's all kinds of seminars and books that you can get on, on how to get leadership, how to have leadership, how to have effective leadership. All I know to do is try to get ahead, lead by example, Amen. do what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to preach and teach and love you folks and pray for you folks and exhort you folks. Then it's up to you. And as far as I can read in the Bible, 
If you won't follow me, there's nothing I can do about it. I personally do not believe that Moses was a failure in leadership. I believe he's a good leader. But there were times where the majority of the people did not believe him and would not follow him. But the Bible says in Exodus 17, 11, and it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Now the one actually doing the leadership of the battle, hands on, was Joshua. Yeah. Joshua was down on the ground, leading the people in the battle. But Moses was positionally essential. And as he stood up there on the top of the hill with a rod of God uh, in his hand, uh, the secret to them winning the battle down on the ground was Moses being able to hold up the rod of God. Now you can compare that to whatever you want to. I like to think of it uh, with relation uh, to the preacher holding forth the Word of God uh, in church. But the fact is that God made Moses a seer or a prophet for the flock. He was the shepherd for the flock. He was the spokesman from God to the flock. And if Moses failed in being able to hold up the rod of God during the battle, the people were going to lose the battle. If he succeeded, the people were going to win the battle. I don't believe that I can prove to you dogmatically that this means that if a preacher preaches the Word of God, everybody's going to do right. But I am encouraged to try to do that. Amen. I'm encouraged to try to preach the Bible and teach the Bible with a hope that somebody's going to get a hold of it. Amen. Somebody's going to get encouraged. Right. Somebody's going to get thrilled. Somebody's going to do right. Amen. Not everybody will. But the second thing I want you to notice is that Moses was physically exhausted. He was positionally essential. But secondly, he was physically exhausted. I read you verse 11 a moment ago. Verse 12 says, But Moses' hands were heavy. Why do you reckon he got tired up there? He wasn't doing anything. I mean, you preachers, all you do is drink coffee and eat cake. Yeah. I was trying to do my best to resist Sister Bobette's donuts this morning. Yeah. That's got to be one of the great temptations in the ministry, is walk a lady in that's coming in from a car in the rain, and she's got a box of Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> For any of you that wonder how we keep anybody in my class back there, that's it. That's yeah. nothing to do with teaching. That's right. Donuts. I don't know why Moses got so tired up there. He wasn't in the fight. Yeah. Any of you ever tried to hold anything up for a long time, though? You hold up something for a long time, you get tired. Some of you have heard me tell about it, and I won't try to go into details, but we were being punished one time as a company in boot camp in the Navy. And uh, somebody had done something wrong. Somebody had sabotaged uh, our barracks for an inspection. And our company commander, he was hot. And he wanted to find out who did it. And he knew somebody knew. And he was going to get somebody to tell. And if somebody didn't tell, he was going to take it out on the whole company. So we, we had a, a rifle they affectionately called a piece in boot camp that they that's just a rifle, but inside the barrel of the rifle they filled it with lead. Make it weigh a little bit heavier. Then they would make us work out with that thing. So he said, everybody grab a piece. We all went, got, we popped tall in front of our locker. Then they made us hold that thing out at eye level. And said, won't you hold it there until somebody tells who did the dastardly deed. Somebody had gone through what they call the head, which was the restroom area, and taking their hand and wiped it across mirrors. Yeah. <laughs> right before we all, or right after we all left, we, we never did know who did it. But we got what they call a hit. You call it a merit, whatever you want. But we got points taken away from us on every mirror that, that they did that to. And it's probably 8, 12, I don't remember how many it was. Anyhow, we got tired. And that was the one time when I was in boot camp that I thought about trying to go over the fence. Yeah. 
<laughs> because after we had done that for a while, we, we had to break for lunch, and he said, when we, he said, when you come back, we are going to work out. I was already worked out. I was ready. I've done it for the week. <laughs> they said, when we come back, we're going to work out. And I, I promise you, I wasn't thinking about eating at lunch. I was thinking about, how do I get out of here? <laughs> I don't know how long this battle lasted, but Moses' hands got weary. You know, when you live near the top, the atmosphere is thinner. Yep. Maybe that had something to do with it. Maybe you got tired, as some preachers do, from looking over and looking after God's people. Yeah. He was literally doing that. And I promise you that it can get wearisome for a preacher to constantly be overseeing people in care, wanting them to do right, wanting them to stay faithful. Maybe it was, and probably most pointedly, the problem was just lifting up his hands with the rod. And there are two things I think of for a preacher. One would be preaching, and the other would be prayer. Lifting up holy hands, the Bible speaks of. Moses got tired. You listen to me, folks. I hope that you pray for this preacher. Amen. And even though that I'm bringing this message, and I believe that God would have me bring the message, I'm not preaching this message because I intend to bellyache today. I'm more encouraged today with what we have gone through with this, I call it a control of virus, Damn, a dim panic. But in calling it that, it's been a trial. It's been, an, it's been a trial. Matter of fact, while we're meeting here, having a good time, there's churches in California that are being forbidden right. to even meet yeah. right now. I'm, I'm full of joy. Yeah. There's a big church out there, some of you know, there's a big church out there in California right now that they're being fined $5,000 per service. There's another big church out in California that the judge ruled against them this week yep. and said that you cannot meet if the local authorities tell you you cannot meet. A judge said that. And the preacher said, we're going to meet anyway. Amen. That's a big church. Yep. I mean, thousands of people are affected one way or the other. And they're waiting to see, what's the preacher going to say? And he said, we're going to meet anyway. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen there. But I'm encouraged Amen. by right here. I'm encouraged by what's going on at Glenwood. And I thank God for each one of you. Please don't take this to mean that the preacher's up here because he's worn out. I may look worn out, but that just has to do with age. <laughs> I'm not here because I'm discouraged. I'm not discouraged. But Moses got physically exhausted. But the third thing I want to point out to you from this passage is Moses had partners enlisted to help him. In verse 12, Moses' hands were heavy and they took a stone and put it under him and he sat there on But even still, his hands were heavy. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands. One guy on one side, one guy on the other side. And they held up Moses' hands so that the rod of God uh, continued to be raised and they were steady until the going down of the sun. Yes. I'd like to encourage you to be like Aaron and her. Amen. This preacher needs your help. Amen. The people who are working in this church need your help. We've got a number of people who are working, and I thank God for them, but, but we don't have nowhere near the workers we need. There are all kinds of things around this church that need to be done. You visitors don't get scared. <laughs> There's all kinds of things around this church that needs to be done, and it can be done if people will just pitch in together Amen. and do what they can. These two men, Aaron and Hur, number one, they saw the need. Thank God for those that are looking to see what needs to be done. And they jumped in and they supported God's man. Amen. Listen, folks, anybody can come in to a church like ours and say, this needs to be repaired. Yes. This needs to be painted. This needs to be replaced. This needs to be fixed. What's hard is, is finding somebody 
that will actually just do it. Amen. Somebody that say, Preacher, here am I. What can I do? Amen. What can I do to help with the load? Right. They supported God's man, and I believe they shared in the victory. Well, it left a roll off a preacher that was uh, that was one of my heroes. He used to call this type of type of Christian an A and H man, Aaron and her. Yeah. He said we need a church full of A and H people, people that are willing to just steady up the hands of the preacher by doing what they can. Somebody needs to teach Sunday school classes. Somebody needs to work with young people. Somebody needs to learn to play musical instruments. Somebody needs to learn to to work in the choir. God's people need to be willing Amen. to take part. That's right. And if you do, you share in the victory. Mm -hmm. Let me close by saying that, that Moses was permanently engaged in the war against Amalek. Right. I know we read about this battle and some people think that they can come in church, help a preacher with a job, and that takes care of it. But the truth is, we need people who will stay here for the long haul. Amen. It's a blessing to see this good crowd this morning without anything special planned. I look at you and I'm thinking, there must be a meal over in the fellowship hall after church is over for this good group of people to show up. But the truth is, people who've been here a while wonder, will you stick? They wonder, will you be here next week? They wonder, will you be here six months from now? A year from now. Will you be here five years from now? Right. And there's a lot of people wonder that about preachers too. If they'll stay. Moses was permanently engaged. I want you to look please in verses 14 through 16. The Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book. And he said, I want you to rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. And I want you to notice right there at the end of the chapter it says, for he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Folks, it's not till we're done that we're done. That's right. Amen. Thank God salvation is finished. Amen. But living for Jesus is a totally different matter. Right. And the work of the church is not done until God calls us home. And then, you sing about it, ladies and gentlemen, when the battle's over, yep. we shall wear a crown. Amen. We shall wear a crown. We shall wear a crown. Sure. When the battle's over, we shall wear a crown sure. in the new Jerusalem. Yeah. My friend, Moses rehearsed that battle because somebody else needs to be willing to fight like the men of the past did. Amen. Somebody needs to be willing. The preachers need to preach like the old preachers preach. Amen. And people need to behave like the old people behave. That's right. People need to go soul winning. And people need to live holy. People need to live godly. People need to be faithful. People need to read their Bibles. Amen. People need to pray. Amen. People need to trust God. Amen. Like people used to. Moses rehearsed the Bible. Somebody needs to tell the young folks how we did it. Amen. And the young people need to keep doing it. Moses relayed the strategy that won. This was to be a memorial in a book. I think there ought to be a book entitled How Moses Built the Church in the Wilderness. Yeah. Well, there is. <laughs> it's right here. Amen. And Moses repeated this thing for future battles. It was rehearsed. It was a memorial. And today, we're drawing from it to encourage you and me Amen. to work together Amen. in an independent Baptist cooperative program. Right. You can't do what somebody else can do, right. but you can do what you can do. Amen. And you know what? The more people we get doing what we can do, the more we'll get done. Amen. I'm not begging. I'm not complaining. <laughs> but would you hold my hands up? as I do what I can. Would you be the Aaron and her that Glenwood Baptist Church needs? Amen. This community needs to hear the gospel. Sure. And while a man of God is positionally essential, yeah. he had partners enlisted Amen. 
And that's the way God wants to do it today. Amen. We work together to reach the world with the gospel. Will you stand with me, please? Head bowed.